Our reading today is from the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, <clears throat> the last of the five books that we call the book of Moses. And I tend to think of it as Moses' obituary. We've been talking about him for many Sundays, and here he dies. A lesson from Deuteronomy chapter 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zor. The Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid hands on him. And the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. There, let us pray. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and what is on each heart today be magnified and transformed and renewed, not by our power, but by yours, Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm walking away from that pulpit, Mike. We'll be all good. Three stories weave together into one. Moses' story the Reformation, and our story. We've been following Moses for months. We watched him get called out of retirement. Raise your hand if you're retired. Okay, out of retirement to trust God through a burning bush, through the Red Sea, into hunger and thirst, and a people who whined and complained. Moses has earned the right, right? To enter the promised land. He should be a shoe-in for a passport. Amen? But he isn't. This is one of the most interesting plot twists in all of Scripture. And we want to make sense of it. Earlier in Deuteronomy, Moses didn't follow the law. Is this why God will not let him set foot in the promised land? I mean, is God really that grace-less? 
Or is Mo Moses being punished for the sins of the Israelites, as some have supposed? You see, we want to try to justify these actions of God. But perhaps the deeper truth in this story is the nature of disappointment. That sometimes life, even the life of faith, doesn't make much sense. That word disappointment is exactly what it says. A missed appointment. A scheduled expectation broken. 500 years ago, Martin Luther nailed his ideas to that church door, hoping to spark a renewal, as Clint said, for his beloved church. And the resulting movements, and right, United Methodism was one of those, helped renew a focus on scripture and faith and grace. It also cast a vision for authentic church grounded in spiritual equality that would be the foundation for future social movements like the American anti-slavery movement with an emphasis, of course, on spiritual equality for all, not just white Christians. And yet 500 years later, we have a better view of the disappointments of the Reformation the conflict and the division and the persecution and the death that did not offer spiritual equality for all. 134 years ago, a Sunday school class at Trinity United Methodist Church here in Durham said, you know, we know people that aren't coming to church. What if we went to where they are? They took the idea to their pastor, and their pastor stood up and said to the congregation, let's consider dividing us in two and sending half of us out. Well, friends, we have had, right, these amazing tough conversations over the past couple years about, about LGBTQ and, and race issues and capital campaign, how to spend that money, and over how to welcome the homeless, right? And in the midst of those beautiful yet tough conversations where we've had doubt and fear and there's been conflict and anger, it's been easy to think that, that that's new to us. But guess what? It's not. It's in the DNA of who we are, not just as Duke Memorial, but as, as a Christian church. Because when that pastor gave that idea to that church, it says in our history book, and I quote, they were agitated and not in favor. <laughs> right? And yet, that seed planted grew into a conviction of a yes journey, a wilderness journey to trust in God in an uncertain beginning. That 131 years ago this month, benches were put inside a tobacco warehouse and the first ever worship service of what would eventually be us, Duke Memorial, took place. Look at the front cover of your bulletin. There it is. That space, that very first yes to trust God. And, and Doris, Doris said it so well. Where is Doris? I've lost her. Doris, Doris, you said it so well this morning that if our walls could talk, our walls would rejoice in the amazing and numerous powerful moments that these walls have experienced. Yes is to Christ and growth in love and in fellowship together. Leaders who during the depression created a loan program. Youth groups who created a worship, a prayer service to pray for the members of this church who during the world wars, who were in the wars. Money raised for missionaries led by Mary and Alan. I miss him right now. I know you do too. West End mentoring, J.J. Henderson friendships, and baptisms, y'all, one after another. Today we're going to celebrate a baptism that happened in 1937, even as we baptize our newest, youngest member. And yet, 
as pastor after leader after minister stood at the peak of their lives, looking across the vision of what was and could be for this church, disappointment was also present. You see, Washington Duke said he wanted a church for the masses, and in reality, our church has been for some masses, right? A Sunday when, when blacks were turned away from this communion rail, early on when women in leadership were, were undercut and not supported well, and our church that stood while other churches literally fell as 147 was built and designed prioritizing power and privilege, which we have. As congregations all around the world today commemorate the 500th birthday of the Reformation, and as we give thanks for Duke Memorial, we reflect on what has been even as we take stock of what is. And not everything is the way we had hoped. The Christian church, says Phyllis Tribble, undergoes a clarifying shakeup every 500 years. Happy birthday. <laughs> Clarifying, cleansing, refining, right? This beautiful shakeup about who we are and whose we are. Sometimes life, friends, even the life of faith, doesn't make sense and we're disappointed. And yet also, we see great power when we see our own stories as a part of a much greater story. Something greater. Scripture actually records the fact that Moses knows in advance that he will not enter the promised land, that he will die before his own expectation is lived out. And do you know what he does on his deathbed standing there? Did you hear it? He praises God. He gives thanks for God, grateful for what is. You see, maybe Moses' journey was not just taken for himself, but as a part of a greater story. In the midst of much change in our world, the potential for us as a church and any church to, to, to gain in the midst of change is greater than the potential for us to lose. And why? Because we are a part of God's greater story, reminded that, friends, the church was Jesus' idea, not ours. How do we see ourselves, Duke Memorial? Inside of God's greater story. That verb for seeing in Deuteronomy is a powerful one because it has God as the subject, not me and not you. You see, the hope for a future, our future, is not dependent upon what Moses or you or I sees. God shows Moses. God reveals to Moses. Of course, yes, we must open our eyes to look for what God is doing and where God is, even as we ask God to, to reveal to us where God already is and then work to join God there. Trust God as we go. Like a Sunday school class, right? From Trinity, who noticed where God already was. You see, our faith ancestors didn't take God to the tobacco warehouses. They went to where God already was and magnified God's presence there and gave those workers a place to worship. Within three weeks, there was 133 people gathered. Like like some of you that I'm looking at, who over, these past, over this past year went to our neighbors whose lives were literally split in half by 147. You went to our neighbors who grew up in Haiti and you recorded their stories and then helped them go before city council to hold city council accountable to live into promises that were never fulfilled. Jesus' justice work in our city. Like... Like just this past week, when one of you started a new book club for people that, that don't already come to this church, and in that first meeting, 
you recognize that God was already there because one of the people said, you know what? I'm, ag- well, I'm atheist, agnostic at best, this person said, and I have worshiped at Duke Memorial. When my child sings with the preschool, yes, but last year you all preached on tough topics and I came and I worshiped and you were so welcoming. I belonged. Everything may not be as we had hoped, and yet we catch glimpses of God again and again, who just might be shaking us up for a new 500, for a new clarifying season in the life of the church, our church, the big church, for the new journey ahead. And we today are invited to look into the face of Moses, best displayed not in front of Pharaoh, or or not coming through the Red Sea, but best displayed here, alone with God, watching over the horizon of his own life's work and feeling gratitude. As he, and, and as we cling to the central claim of our faith, gratitude in a story that is being told that is much greater than each of us. And so friends, today we eat cake and we rejoice. Why? Because we are a part of God's story. Because we are in a place that is alive with the witness of Jesus in our church and in our city. Why? Because of the opportunities we have as we look across the landscape of what we've been given. For a people that are here and for a people that are not yet here. That God gives us. Who, quote, do not go to church but could be reached. Those words written in 1885, a seed planted for this church and written again on our hearts today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of God's people say,